Well, we began to study Nehemiah, but this is an interesting day for review. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name's Rod Hembry and the weekend edition of Bible Discovery TV. Corey is here and Ryan, mm -hmm. what's going on, Corey? So today we're going to be doing a chapter by chapter review of everything that we've read so far this past week. So we're gonna be starting in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, going all the way to Nehemiah chapter four. So if you need to get yourself caught up or you just wanna test your memory, stick around and we'll talk about it after. Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. And it came to pass in the month of Nisan, in the twentieth year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, that I took the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had never been sad in his presence before. Therefore the king said to me, Why is your face sad, since you are not sick? This is nothing but sorrow of heart. So I became dreadfully afraid and said to the king, May the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad when the city, the place of my father's tombs, lies waste and its gates are burned with fire? Then the king said to me, what do you request? So I prayed to the God of heaven, and I said to the king, If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, I ask that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tombs, that I may rebuild it. Then the king said to me, the queen also sitting beside him, How long will your journey be, and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I set him a time. Furthermore, I said to the king, If it pleases the king, let letters be given to me for the governors of the region beyond the river, that they must permit me to pass through till I come to Judah, and a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he must give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel, which pertains to the temple, for the city wall, and for the house that I will occupy. And the king granted them to me, according to the good hand of my God upon me. Then I went to the governors in the region beyond the river, and gave them the king's letters. Now the king had sent captains of the army and horsemen with me. When Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite officially heard of it, they were deeply disturbed that a man had come to seek the well-being of the children of Israel. Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. There is no question about it. The enemy of our soul, and that, that is Satan, there's no question about it. He was in a serious rage about Nehemiah's trip back to Jerusalem. This was an arduous time in the ancient land, which was going through a restoration of God-fearing worship. God had destroyed this place because they had left him. And now God was rebuilding everything. Truly, God is in control of everything. And we should always remember that the enemy will lose. In fact, he has already lost. This time is frozen in the scriptures for us to read and learn and understand how God works through the difficulties we face. Now, in the end, the Lord will be seen by all. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess and every person will have no choice but to proclaim the following. Jesus Christ is Lord. And that's true. We're going to study that today as we begin to teach on this particular passage of scripture we're talking about Nehemiah chapter 2. This is an amazing passage, and if you have your Bible guide, turn to it. The Bible guide is available. You can write for yours. The address is at the bottom of the screen, or you can call, and that's a good way to do it. You can use a credit card or whatever you need to do and uh, make a donation, or you can go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com, and when you go there, you can digitally give. It's really exciting, and it's, uh, it's really good to do that, so thank you. Let me just say... Thank you to everyone for your donations. Those donations are amazing in this time and we very much appreciate it. But I need to tell you that it's not us that appreciates it, that 
makes you give, it's because it's to the Lord's work. And this is the Lord's work. It is his word that we teach. And that's what we teach on. So let me just say that God is pleased, I believe, because we are teaching only the word of God. And as we continue teaching, uh, people will continue to give and uh, God will bless them. It's very interesting. Now the enemy's rage. And let me tell you, the enemy has rage. We're talking about Nehemiah chapter two, one through 10. And Father, I pray today in the name of Jesus Christ, by the power of your Holy Spirit, help us to hear this today so we can understand the enemy and how he looks at us, how he sees us and goes after us. But then help us to understand the power of your Holy Spirit, which makes us people that we were not before because we came to know Jesus Christ as our Lord. And in Jesus' name, we want to read from the Bible, not into the Bible, that becomes very important. Help us to hear that and help us to do it in Jesus' name. And we said together, all of us, amen. Now, as we look at this, Nehemiah chapter two, verses one through three, here is what the Bible says. And it came to pass in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, that I took the wine and gave it to the king. This is Nehemiah talking. Now I had never been sad in his presence before because that was illegal. Therefore, the king said to me, why is your face sad since you are not sick? This is nothing but sorrow of heart. So I became dreadfully afraid and said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad when the city, the place of my father's tombs, lies in waste, and its gates are burned with fire. I want to tell you something. Nehemiah was really brave. And Nehemiah was sorrowful for Jerusalem, which lay in ruins. Now listen carefully. We should always be listening to God and assessing his kingdom. God's kingdom is not about our comfort. God's kingdom is not about us feeling good about something. It's completely about what God tells us. It's completely about what God thinks and God feels. Our lifestyle moves us in his direction. We praise his name. And what happens is we get focused on God's kingdom. And the next thing you know, God begins to do things for you. You didn't even expect. You don't have to pray and ask God for a vacation. He'll give you one. You don't have to pray and ask God for this. He'll give you one. Just focus on his kingdom. Seek his kingdom and do what's right in his eyes. That's the most important thing. And let me tell you something, that is a good way to live. Not putting yourself first, but putting others first. I want to tell you something. It starts with your family, your husband, wife, and kids. It becomes very important. And the rest of your family as well. And then it goes out from there. Now, let's go back to the scripture and learn more. Nehemiah is in this particular mix. And the king said to me, what do you request? So I prayed to the God of heaven. And I said to the king, if it pleases the king and if, you, and if your servants has found favor in your sight, I ask that you send me to Judah. What? Send you to Judah? To the city of my father's tombs that I may rebuild it. Nehemiah, man, that's incredible. You see, Nehemiah was honest as he prayed to the God, to God rather, in front of the king. God answers our prayer as we are honest about our worship of him. Honest about our worship of God. I remember when I was asked what I did, I used to say, well, I'm a TV producer. I'm a TV producer. I would be reluctant to tell them that we produce a program or back in the day called 100 Huntley Street that told people about Jesus Christ and who he is. Well, now today it's much easier because I understand what this means. Oftentimes we pray and Nehemiah was in front of the king and the king asked him this and he had to think for a minute. And in that time of thinking, he thought, Lord, I wanna go back and I wanna fix that wall. I wanna help repair that city. So I'm going to ask, help me to do so. And then he turns to the king. Now that gets really interesting, doesn't it? He says, I want to go home. Let me go home. I'll come back, but let me go home. Wow. 
That's interesting. All right, let's go back to the scripture and learn what happened. So then the king said to me, the queen also sitting beside him, so the king and the queen are together, how long will your journey be? And when will you return? That was amazing. So it pleased the king to send me, and I set him a time. Furthermore, I said to the king, if it pleases the king, let letters be given to me for the governors of the region beyond the river, that they may, must permit me to pass through till I come to Judah. And a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he must give me timber to make beams. For the gates of the citadel, which pertains to the temple, for the city wall and for the house that I will occupy. And the king, <laughs> he granted them to me according to the good hand. And this is important. According to the good hand of my God upon me. He recognized that right there. Verse nine says, then I went to the governor in governors in the region beyond the river and gave them the king's letters. He's operating on the king's authority. And now the king had set captains of the army and horsemen with me. And when Sambalat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard of it, they were deeply disturbed that a man had come to seek the well-being of the children of Israel. I want to tell you something. You know, God is doing an amazing thing here. And Nehemiah was given a pass to go back and help Israel. Nehemiah had that permission. You see, when the Lord does something, it is obvious and frequently insults those who are against him. That's because the Lord's doing it. When God does it, I want to tell you, it's very interesting because he turns it around. We, look, we've, we've seen this. We're going to see this again in Esther. We've seen this in other books. We've seen this so far. You know, you talk about the first Chronicles and the say, you see this. Let me tell you something. It looks like the enemy is having his way with us now. But let me tell you something. The Lord covers everything. And if we are Christians and we trust in the Lord, a Christian is a person who follows Christ, not cultural. It's a person who follows Christ and we trust the Lord. God will make this thing turn around for his glory. People will come to him as a result of this, and Satan will be lost in this whole thing. So beloved, we need to understand that we have to give God our life. We have to let him work in our life. We have to trust God. And when we trust God, things change. And we learn that God does what's best for us. No matter what happens, God always does what's best. Good afternoon. This is really interesting because as we begin to study what we've looked at this past week, uh, the, you know, we're going through the historical times. And last time we looked at when Israel and fell and all of that. But this time we actually go to the restoration or the coming back after the exile. And we're part of that too. So this is covering a lot of years, but it's really interesting. So Corey. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going from the, the, the kingdom of Judah is still alive and kicking. We're starting in second Chronicles chapter 20, and we're going to be going all the way to Nehemiah chapter four. So we are going to be going through quite a bit of history. So let's just jump in. Uh, chapter 20, second Chronicles chapter 20. Remember last uh, weekend, we ended off with Jehoshaphat and he was good, good king, really good king, but he got himself in a little bit of trouble by trying to make uh, an alliance and a peace treaty with Ahab, you know, Ahab and Jezebel in Northern Israel. And it didn't really go well for Jehoshaphat, but when he got reprimanded by the prophet of God, he really tried to make amends. 
So in chapter 20, we're still in this reign of Jehoshaphat, and we get this really cool account of uh, the Moabites and the Ammonites uh, joining together with the Edomites and, and marching on Judah. And this is a really big deal. Jehoshaphat doesn't think that the, the, the Judeans are going to be strong enough to push back these armies, to defeat these armies. So he goes to God and he prays, and God just says, march march out. You're not going to have to fight. So I love this. Jehoshaphat goes out and he gets some Levites to sing. He's like, okay, okay, we're going to, we're going to march out. We're going to sing. We're going to sing all the way. And God miraculously uh, confuses and defeats the Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite coalition. uh, And Jehoshaphat gets to see all of this happen. You know, that's, it, that, that's amazing yeah. because of the book of Judges with, uh, with Gideon and, and all of that. It's really amazing. Holding the trumpet in the right hand and the torch in their left hand, fascinating. That continues, right? Yeah, no, that just reminded me that, you know, worshiping God is so important. It, it really does attract God mm-hmm. when, you, when you start to praise and worship Him. You know, you might be surprised at what happens. And it changes the atmosphere around you. It does, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And Jehoshaphat must have known that because what what a scary thing. One army, one small army that had already been humbled severely during his reign, going out to meet a coalition of three big, bad Mm -hmm. armies, and God just says, march. Ah, I don't know Mm -hmm, that I I would have been able to do that. Very scary. Considered suicide, but it wasn't because God was like. So chapter 21, Jehoshaphat dies and his son Jehoram, who uh, actually has been married off to Ahab and Jezebel's daughter, Mm -hmm. Athalia, he becomes king. And this is really tragic because as soon as Jehoshaphat dies, Jehoram has his other six brothers killed. Uh, he doesn't want any competition for the throne, even though he was firmly established. So he he kills off all of his, uh, his brothers, and then he follows, the Bible says he follows the way of the Israelite kings. This is not a good thing. Uh, he his family were Judean kings. They were kings in the line of David. Uh, And the Israelite kings, it was chaos up there and they were all involved in idol worship. So that's what he began to do. Uh, The Bible says that because of this idol worship, God brought nations against him to humble him. Edom rebelled, Libna rebelled. In fact, we even have in this chapter 21, a letter from the prophet Elijah uh, chastising Jehoram. You know, it says, Elijah actually says, you killed your brothers who were better than you, better mm-hmm. men than you were. So this is a really uh, brutal thing. Um, all of Jehoram's children uh, end up getting killed by the Philistines, except for his youngest son, Ahaziah. Uh, he ends up dying, uh, Je- uh, Jehoram does, of a bowel disease that was prophesied against him as well. And the Bible actually says that when he dies, it was to no one's regret. Mm-hmm. So this is not a good king. No good. one liked this situation. Unfortunately, then his son, Ahaziah, comes to the throne. He's not a very good king either. He ends up getting murdered by Jehu. If you'll remember from back in uh, First and Second Kings, mm-hmm. Jehu in northern Israel took out Ahab and Jezebel, and he became a new king. He also took out uh, Ahaziah. Uh, unfortunately, that that meant that Athaliah, who was the queen mother at that point, she just decides, well. You know, my family's been taken out in the north. I'm going to take out this one in the south. And she kills everyone. She must have had quite a few supporters because she was able to kill off the royal family, Hmm. uh, except one, a sister of Ahaziah, daughter of King Jehoram, so uh, a granddaughter of Jehoshaphat, ends up saving one baby, one son. Uh, She saves him, and, and his name is Joash. So that was all in chapter 22. So you get this really, the palace intrigue of Judah and Jerusalem is not going very well. Now that that uh, woman who saved Joash, she's a kingly descendant of David. She carries the royal bloodline. And the Bible tells us that she's married to the priest Jehoiada. 
So Jehoiada then, uh, he, he ends up saving the Davidic dynasty by making allegiances for this little baby, Joash, to come to the throne, which Joash does come to the throne when he's seven. Uh, he becomes king, and that's recorded in chapter 24. But you get this distinct impression that priest Jehoiada is actually ruling the kingdom for him. And he, he probably is to some extent. But. He, he, I'm pretty sure that <laughs> yeah. he was. I would agree with you. Uh, because when Jehoiada dies, it says that Jehoiada is buried in the king's tombs. Mm -hmm. So he's counted as a king himself. That's what that means. Unfortunately, then after Jehoiada passes away, Joash, it says he listens to the officials of Judah who wanted to bring back idol worship. Uh, Jehoiada was a priest, a Levitical priest, so he was all about the temple, mm -hmm. and he wanted to only worship God. So now he's dead and gone, and Joash has other people that he has to appease, so he decides that idol worship is okay. Because of this, Jehoiada's son, Zechariah, actually prophesies against Joash. Now, it can come as a bit of a surprise to us that Joash then orders Zechariah stoned. But think about this for a second. Jehoiada the priest had been ruling as king. He was married to a princess, a Davidic princess. Zechariah has David's blood running through mm -hmm. his veins. And now he says to the crowned king, he says to him, you have rejected God. God has rejected you. That sounds like a challenge to the throne, it does. does it not? It does. Yeah. So it's mm -hmm. not really surprising then that Joash turns around and has him stoned because he sees him as a threat. As a threat to, to the, And maybe he was. I yeah. don't, I don't Interesting. know. Interesting. Anyway, Joash ends up getting wounded in battle and uh, his officials kill him. They finish him off. And here's the thing. The Bible actually notes that he was not buried with the kings. Mm -hmm. So Jehoiada was, and but Joash not. wasn't. Yeah. So we see this interesting kind of duality there. All right. So, um, oops, I stepped on my mic cable there. So if anyone <laughs> hears a bang, that's what that was. Okay. So uh, Amaziah, his son, comes to the throne. He ends up executing the officials who killed his dad. This was just kind of an honor thing that you have to do. Uh, he's an okay uh, king, uh, but he ends up getting a little bit too big for his britches. And uh, it antagonizes the Israelite king who marches into Judah and destroys the wall of Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. So, and he ends up dying in a coup against him. So not great. They replace him with his son, Uzziah, who is a good king. He, he uses his time of peace to rebuild Jerusalem, to do a bunch of good stuff. He gets a little prideful. Mm -hmm. uh, it, this is in chapter 26. And he ends up getting afflicted with leprosy, doesn't die right away. The next king of Jerusalem is Jotham, and he's a pretty good guy. That he, that's in chapter 27. He gets kind of the biblical check mark from the author there. <laughs> uh, his son Ahaz in chapter 28, he's a king all involved in idolatry. He makes a deal with the king of Assyria. Mm -hmm. It's just a bad scene. Ahaz is a bad dude. Uh, he actually refurbishes Jerusalem and the temple for idol worship. Hmm. Surprisingly, in chapter 29, his son is one of the best kings of Israel. One of the best. Hezekiah. Hezekiah. And he completely uh, flips over all of those things that his dad had done, and he, he serves God. So chapter 29, 30, and 31 is all about Hezekiah purifying mm -hmm. the temple, purifying the land. 32, we get the Assyrian uh, invasion of Sennacherib. And then from 33 to 36, we get these last kings of Judah Gina. and Jerusalem, who in increasing amounts rebel against God uh, and end up uh, inciting the rage of the, the Neo-Babylonian Empire who come in and destroy Jerusalem. So that wraps Ezra. up the history of Second Chronicles. Ezra. 
The exiles return to build the temple. Okay. After is, 70 years. After 70 years, uh, Ezra 1 and 2, it's just different exiles who are returning. Uh, 3, they start to rebuild the temple. They run into some opposition in chapters 4 through 6. Uh, and then, you know, in chapter 9 and 10, there's some of these intermarriage issues and morality issues that the people begin to deal with. And, Ezra has to deal with those as well. So, but the book of Ezra in a nutshell is the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem by the exiles who have been released mm -hmm. by the new ruling power of the day, which is Persia. Persia and King Cyrus the Great. So then we also read up till today, the first four chapters of Nehemiah. Nehemiah. Yep. So Ezra deals with rebuilding the temple and Nehemiah deals with rebuilding the wall of the city, mm -hmm. the protection of Jerusalem. And Ezra is kind of a priestly type. Well, he is a priestly type. Yeah, he was a priest. Nehemiah is not. Nope. He's just a good old guy, you know, who works in the kingdom as yep. the cupbearer for the king. Cupbearer, though, very, very oh, and, powerful. Yeah. Position. Very yep. prestigious. Yep. Exactly. Yes. And, and that was something to consider because, I mean, he was, I mean, think it through. I mean, it was an exile, really? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he mm -hmm. was. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it was really interesting. We have 30 seconds left. We have 30, that's okay. We've got, uh, you know, Nehemiah goes to Jerusalem in chapter two and he assesses the wall and they begin to build the wall in chapter three and chapter four, they get a little bit of um, uh, opposition to building the wall. And we're gonna pick Nehemiah up as we continue to read it this week. So that's where we are. I hope you caught up uh, and I hope you stick with us this week as we continue to read through the Old Testament. <laughs> 